Hi, I'm Erdoğan. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Lapland. Today I'm going to talk about the speculative battlefield of a placeless warfare and the narrative means by which military violence survives its open-endedness. War is of course understood in opposition to peace. The place of war is fundamentally different from our place, which is the place of peace. Now, remote warfare blurs this fundamental difference in a way that is not unlike the nuclear warfare. In the nuclear imaginary, destruction and salvation used to coexist unproblematically. This is the warfare Derrida had deemed fabulously textual, for the nuclear war has not taken place. As to the remote warfare, nothing's textual about the drone strikes and proxy wars. But less obvious is the way the open-endedness of this violence plausibly sustains itself. Remote warfare intimates the plausibility of an everywhere war that is likely to go on forever. This speculative everywhere, much like the Gothic specter, refers to a presence and an absence, and it is thus that the speculative battlefield constitutes a de facto shelter for the image of remote agency. To put it in Freudian terms, the image is that of the homeless self, who clings to a sense of estrangement. To the unbearable elusiveness of our place, the figure of remote warrior responds precisely with its strange placelessness. It's strange because it is perfectly at home in between destruction and salvation. The implied agency of remote warfare is, as such, the protagonist of a survival fiction. Its being at home depends on conceiving of the home as unhomely. More explicitly, the implied agency stands as a perversion of Kafka's narrative formula, stated as, to replace the world as we know it to be with the world as we fear it might be. Political power based on military violence as we know it to be is simply unsustainable. So to the unbearable question, how could military violence still sustain itself, remote warfare responds with the fearful narrative of what might be. In other words, with the plausible fiction of placelessness. The military idiom of remoteness legends not exactly a placeless violence, but a speculative place in which violent agency could survive its open-endedness. The figure of remote warrior becomes plausible not really as a destroyer of place-based life, but as a privileged survivor of its own violence. But the plausible distance to violence is the flip side of the relentless claim to surveillance proximity. This celeptic speculation on distance can be traced to a political desire, to exercise violence without being exposed to violence. The remote warrior is not just a military metaphor for normalized violence at a distance. It is, above all, the cornerstone of a narrative world in which agential omnipresence can be imagined, not just for the military, but also for the rest of us. Where military violence justifies the manipulation of the taken-for-granted idea of distance, agential detachment prescribes an idiomatic smooth space. This violent worlding resonates, perhaps too readily, with an audience that inhabits a world in flux. If special totalization frames the future world of remote warfare, its speculative battlefield constitutes an escape from the present one. Arguably, the remote warrior, and thus, could be sharing an escape route, from homelessness to placelessness. That's in as much as we presume the blurring of the war-peace opposition. The speculative possibility of exercising violence precisely from within peace involves a narrative rejection. The remote warrior displaces its unbearable open-endedness quite plausibly with its fictional remoteness. Notably, the idiom of secrecy underpins remote warfare by projecting an agency that is radically detached from the political reality. This narrative embrace of the placeless war will be unthinkable without our suspension of disbelief. That's in return of an escape from the hegemony of the homeless self. What overrides the objection of military violence is the plausibility of a remote warrior 
which operates from nowhere and everywhere. And this is not unheard of. To paraphrase Susan McManus, fictions involve a radical detachment from the order of things, precisely through an estrangement to that which merely is. Obviously, speculation is not anything goes. The manipulation of distance takes effect as a survival strategy as it challenges the limits of human agency. So its appeal is not just to the military. Crucially, the speculative extent of the battle space bears the mark of a worlding that counts on the suspension of our disbelief. It's not that military logistics does not admit of any exteriority. Rather, the otherwise unfamiliar places are readily internalized in their violent familiarity. Under the military claim to keep violence at a distance, one could discern a narrative rejection of the agential boundaries. While the war is not a fiction, thinking its unthinkable mingling with the peace requires speculation, namely in mapping one's relationship to unfamiliar places. The rejection of the a priori enemy has quietly given way to an endless speculation on the enemy place. But who has the privilege to speculate? In that, Edward Said had to call on Marx to stress the dependency of power relations on the privilege to represent, or on the epistemic license to ponder alterity. As in a detective serial, the speculative figure of detective emerges not not in the hope of an ultimate victory, but by surviving the series. The speculative subject survives by submitting itself to the epistemic subjectivity. <clears throat> if the mythical warrior could survive on an open-ended license to ponder alterity, there may be no way to extricate the survival of the drone mythology from the seriality of drone targeting. I think that remote violence, as embodied by the liminal figure of drone operator, sustains itself as a surveillant privilege, as it plausibly approximates the transgressive gaze that the open-ended travel narrative implies. The operator can be seen as both central and external to the speculative battle space. Surviving on violence is apparently conditional on self-estrangement. The subject of the warfare, we may take it for granted, to operate across the boundary that separates war from peace by the very fact of being liminal to the war. I would say that the placeless operator of the drone bets on the speculative status of the war zone, just as we embrace our place as an already questionable idea. More than a deception, the fiction of remoteness frames an insular field of agency. Like the island utopia, literally a no place, the strange agency of remote warfare is both violence-free and violence-born. As Derek Gregory suggests, the logic of late modern targeting depends on an electronic disjuncture between the eye and the target. Now let me contribute to this abstraction by proposing that the remote warrior survives its object strangeness by weaponizing estrangement. The detached stranger stands for spatial transgression, but the transgression in question is strictly speculative. If distant violence presumes optical disjuncture, surveillant proximity affects cognitive estrangement, to borrow Suwin's term of art. As territorial boundaries crumble, the weaponized fiction of boundary crossing still entertains the vital idea of boundary. This is the case with the open-ended claim to optical estrangement, such as that of the remote warrior. We seem to survive the terrifying blurring of boundaries by formulating it in the horrifying knowledge of insularity. In the plausible world of remote warfare, agential precarity remains conveniently subdued by narrative insularity. The public legend of clandestine omnipresence relies on a sprawling network of paramilitary proxies and private military companies. Yet this intricate performance of placeless presence is but a hectic play of inclusion-exclusion. 
Not unlike the insularity of utopia, the speculative battle space escapes veracity for its chance closure. In effect, the factual open-endedness of the war is shadowed by the performative configuration of the war zone. In remote warfare, perhaps like nowhere else, one could witness the special play of utopian insularity. Island imaginaries are indeed both bound and unbound, or rather the boundaries of the battle space is part of the speculation. Even as the island never admits anything exterior to itself, as Louis Maren suggests, the claim becomes plausible on a narrative neutralization that affirms negation and denies the negative. At least here, insularity matters as a fictional structure that prescribes a liminal agency. In its colonial days, the danger of liminality used to beset the imperial agency, threatening it with the blurring of agential boundaries. Luckily, however, the terror of being at the mercy of one's own limits is neutralized by the narrative horror of a singular crossing into the heart of darkness. The narrative of a one-off failure plausibly represses everyday precarity. Narrative is a transformative tool, we are told, so it enables self-estrangement, or the postulation of some remote warrior. Remote warfare constitutes a survival fiction in being the narrative home to agential homelessness. Thus, as in Ballard's bet on the precarity of reality, so as to prescribe its survival. Taking his cue from Conrad, he proposed, immerse yourself in the most destructive element and swim. Thank you for listening.